All right, so good afternoon. I'm Rohit Bhardwaj. I've been using cloud technologies for quite a while. Um, it's been seven, eight years. And uh, one of the basics which changed the world is basically containerization. So this talk is a basic talk. We'll go over the basics regarding the cloud computing and why containerization is important. Um, I'll give you a preview of what we're going to discuss. First, we'll discuss why the containers are really important, why it is becoming industry standards now. A lot of the platforms are now adopting the standards, so it's not something new which has come in. Then we will dive into Dockers, um, explain like what's, what are the characteristics of Dockers. And uh, if you see Kubernetes, the, it runs on, it, it can contain many Docker images. So it's kind of an extension of Dockers. And uh, same thing is true with um, Docker images can also be used for, um, from the DC OS perspective. You can also have um, um, a Docker image spawned there. So orchestration-wise, um, I think I, I like the Kubernetes because it gives a good understanding how to use it and how the services are maintained. So we'll go over in detail about that. Does that sound good? Yes? All right. So as we know that, you know, uh, when we start building our applications, all our applications, you can consider that as a node, okay, in the cloud somewhere. And you want to make sure that it's a, it, you can spawn as many nodes as possible. That means if while processing some record, something fails, uh, let's say this microservices fails, it will spawn to this microservice and I'll return the value for you. So that's the resiliency which, which can get built into the system. Now what the Docker provides is um, the startup time. Now the startup time, uh, how much time does it take for your server to start up? Anyone? Few minutes? Yep. So in Docker, because it's a running image, so it takes like milliseconds to start the server. That's the, the, that's, that's the beauty about Docker is, so we can, we can have that, that service running. Now, when you're building your application, you're not just building one application which is running as a container here. You have to make sure that you take care of the private cloud as well as public cloud. So your, your Docker image can be residing in any places. So why this is important, because when you're building application, you want to build in such a way that it can be deployed anywhere. For example, we built our application and we were using AWS, Amazon Web Services, and uh, later on we decided to move to Google. It was, it was a, just a pretty simple switch. Uh, it took us like 15 days to move, but because we were using Docker images, uh, it was pretty easy to, you know, containerize images so easy to move from one place to another place. That's the beauty about this. Now, with great power comes great responsibility. That means when you use Docker images, um, you might want to, you want to make sure that you use best practices for, for creating these images. So not just create it, create a microservice. And when you create a microservice, it doesn't mean that it will perform. It, you have to take care of, uh, security in mind, you have to take care of the performance in mind. So those two aspects are really important. And while we scale our application, one of the paradigm which has come in is with the DCOS and, and other containers systems is that if you see, this is the infrastructure, you know, manually provisioned value which is there. There is very much a possibility that you can run the batch processing in the back end while your load is down and ramp up this load when, 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 when there is high demand, you ramp up the load and then it goes down. That means the night processes with the processes which you used to run at night, now because this containerized images, what you can do is uh, you're going to still utilize the same amount of resources in terms of the memory, in terms of the computing power, but just like analytics, you can run heuristics or analytics on top of the system. So a lot of companies have started doing that. So one of the ways they do that is 
you're, you have a Docker image, you, you deploy it, but you have the, you, you just have like five services running, five servers running. And, and if, if there is a less load, you make less computation power there. But at that same time, you can run any heuristics, how the customer performed, how the customer did, did that work. And that's part of, uh, you know, um, you, can, you can use for that, you know, Spark and Cassandra uh, to run the, you know, run in the back end and it will run through all, all the values. So that's, that's the kind of model which we have got here. Now in case of um, Orbits or any other, uh, any other tool that you use, um, and you probably book hotels and airline tickets and you want to get the least amount of fare and, and come out of it. Now if you think about it, all these things 10 years ago, doing the same thing was we were putting everything in SQL Server, SQL databases, not anymore. Because you have to retrieve this data really fast. Now what's happening is all this data which we see here, all the airlines, they are competing against each other. So what it means that when, when, both, when you start, start the search, all the airlines, they have cached values. They have cached all these values. And then they are returning it from the Cassandra database or highly available database, whatever database you are using. So, you need to make sure that you have containerized images which support this model. So that's, that's the key part here in this case. And uh, uh, same, thing is, uh, same thing is being done by, uh, you know, um, with Netflix. That what Netflix does is that, uh, you know, it, it runs all the, uh, all the heuristics which it needs to run at, at, at a deployment time, different deployment time. So that's where another question which comes in that when you have a product, when you are building a product, what happens when you build a product? You have new versions coming out? Yes? So how do you take care of those new versions? How do you do versioning of those? Like, which software is deployed where? So that's something uh, we will discuss, like, you know, there are tools which are available which does that. Kubernetes support the versioning model also. So Docker came along, and Docker has been used for Docker for build. How many here use Docker for build? Or they have, their company use that? Yep. So this is a pretty common, like conf all the configuration parameters which we are adding, Chef, Puppet, um, and uh, dev tools which we are using, they are all using Dockers. Docker as, as a particular image which we are trying to create. For orchestration also, you know, Docker is being used, but mainly nowadays, it's either you would, I would tend towards either Kubernetes or Mesos, you know, uh, for DCOS, for orchestration. If I have multiple images, like let's say I have like 20 or 30 images or 100 images are there, uh, you can use Docker Swarm, um, uh, I'm not against it, but uh, if, you, if you want more stable system, you might want to try different uh, other technologies also along with this. And basically all these technologies were based on the service discovery. That means you deploy your container and container registers themselves. Like a, let's say you deploy a Cassandra node. It registers to a service discovery locator. And basically you, you, if that Cassandra node goes down, the service discovery will send the request to another node. That's the key part here. So what it means is it's all about applications. When we are building our application, we want to make sure that we build, we spend most of our time in building application. What we used to do, and most of our monolithic app currently are doing that. We have one server and one application. Yep, that's the way we have it right now. That means if I have a MySQL, MongoDB, Redis, so what happens, we have one server which connects MySQL, MongoDB, Redis I might have two servers because, and Next.ng I have two servers to support the load balancing. What's wrong in this picture? What's really happening is Next.ng, if I t talk about Next.ng, what's really happening is that this 10% is just for the CPU utilization. Like what all things it has, memory utilization and other utilization which are there. So that's, that's what Next.ng is using it for. We used to use hypervisor and you know most of the VMware and you know other system which we are using, they are all using the hypervisor 
way of connecting it, where you have a hardware with a hypervisor and a virtual machine which connects through a Linux system or win Windows system to the different application which you're trying to build. So now what you need to do, what we need to do is, an hypervisor can be of two types, you know, it, it can have an operating system, most of them have operating system or it is part of, um, you know, uh, as a separate operating system is also there for this one. But if you consider, if you have 10 applications, what it means that 80% of utilization is just by providing this physical machine support. So you have not even run a single line of code and you're spending this much amount of time doing that. That's where the Lambda, you know, uh, you know, serverless architecture is coming in. Now serverless architecture, what's going to happen is that the code will reside, uh, you know, in, in a container and that code will get executed at runtime. So you're only paying for when you execute that code. Whenever there is an event takes place, then you execute that code. So what it means, where are you having a business value? Anyone? In this application? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is that we are all focused on what? Apps. We just want to make sure that app is running correctly. I don't care whether which OS I'm using, which VM I'm using, which hypervisor I'm using at the end of the day. Make sense? So that's where it comes the, all the application which I'm trying to develop, that's where the container comes in. I can put anything in that container and it will perform. Uh, whatever I tell it to do. That's, that's, what, that's what it's trying to do here. So what it means, it can have a Cassandra box here. It can have my old application which is running, you, you can put it in that also, and it will spawn faster. I mean, it has some benefits uh, that way also uh, there. So what it really means that now, from the OS perspective, we are not spending 50% of CPU and, uh, and you know, 40 GB of RAM in running these, these containers. That's, that's the key part here, which, which we are going to get uh, from this. So earlier, what used to happen was that Whenever we used to have a file, I have a lib.so file, and we used to put these files in application servers here itself. Is that a good thing? That used to be and, uh, a pattern like 10, 10 years ago. Uh, you know, we, I have also got a monolithic app where all the property files are residing in the application itself. Not a good idea. So we have to take those things out. And I would suggest you to go through 12-factor application. There's something called 12-factor app. And it does talk about, like, you know, you want to make sure that all the application, all the configuration files must be residing outside this VM where all our application we are running. Why? Because if this goes down, I should be able to get it from external source. You have to mount the drive. Let's say, for example, you're, you're writing it to a disk. You don't want to write it to a, to, to a Docker container here. You have to write it to a particular, particular place. Make sense? So that's the key part here, uh, which we are trying to get here. So how does the container work? So now, if you think about it, uh, what's really happening is that if there is, a, if there is a container, now there are three things which, which, which are there. You need a file directory system. You need processes, you are running some processes which you are trying to run, and container provides these two aspects, which are really the key part here. So what it does is that container provides for each container will get their own directory structure. That means you are not sharing same directories among different, different uh, application servers. Earlier we used to do that, which was our entire pattern. Now, because I'm running within myself, I can, I can have the same configuration spawn again and again. That's the beauty about this one. What else does it have? It has a process ID also, like you, what kind of processes are running. So you can define all those processes also as part of, um, as, as part of this application itself. Now, you can also do, say that, hey, how much memory and CPU do I need to give to maybe uh, this container. This container might get more 
maybe this container don't need it. So you give less memory usage to that. So control group, you have a control over like what memory usage you want to give, what's the speed you want, you want, you want that to run, you know, how much uh, is, is it using. And capabilities, like, you know, what kind of audits, can you do audit controls, uh, you know, other, what kind of controls you can do. This is all Linux, so it, it comes up like, you know, free from that perspective. Now, where does Docker come in? Docker provides a layer, layering support, okay? If I say layering support, what it means that if you think about this box, isn't it seems like, like you're putting different layers on top of it, each other? What's the benefit you get out of this? Let's think about it. When I'm putting this layer, and then another doubling layer is there, what if there is a change coming in Dublin? What do I need to test? Only Dublin. So when I create my Docker file, I'm creating a Docker file, I'm putting different layers. First add the operating system, after that add Dublin, then add Emacs, and then add Apache image. Now if there is a change coming in, the, in, in, in particular on, on, in this version, what are you gonna do? You're gonna just rerun the same thing, rebuild the same image, another image, and deploy it. It's as simple as that. Earlier, what was the case? What, do you, what we had to do? We have to retest everything in the world. Like, if you just got like one simple change, oh, we have to test the whole application server. In this case, it's more contained for you. What's really happening is that from the Docker engine perspective, what it's providing us is namespaces, C groups, and capabilities. We talked about it. That's all part of Linux kernel. That's the operating system which it provides. That means it is taking care of the CPU, memory, and, and the disk space. All three things it's taking care of. Make sense? Now, the key part is that when we are building this application, you can build an application in your laptop, and we have the same thing. Like when, as a developer, I'm working, I have a developer Linux boxes, two Linux images, in my development environment. So I don't need to go to Amazon or, Amazon or AWS or Google. I can just work within my laptop environment and debug using that. But when I want to deploy it, I can put it in any of these networks. But the important thing is that when I'm running a Windows application, it needs to make sure that it uses the Windows kernel. When I'm running the uh, the Linux application, it needs to make sure it has a Linux kernel. That's the only difference which, which is there. Apart from that, most of things are the same here. Yes? Yes. So I'll come to that one as an example. What we are, I'm, going to, I'm going to put different layers. And then when I'm creating a Docker file, earlier what was happening? I was creating an install process. That install process was getting all these things from different places, combining an image and returning from there. Here the versioning mechanism is much easier. You just need to change that version, which is whichever version is, Big Mac version, whatever version is changing. That's what you need to do here. So, Docker, with Simon, what he's saying is that if you make it open source and solve one problem at a time, it really helps. And that's the main reason Docker is selling more, like, you know, and everyone has adapted based on it. So, so I mean, they're all supporting this, these standards. Um, as part of it, like, you know, there's something called Docker Hub, and I'll go over in, in detail what it is, uh, but there's something called Docker Hub, it's just like GitHub, okay? GitHub, you have a GitHub code. How much time does it take for you to run and install and run GitHub? A lot of time. I mean, if you have an application, if you have to install Cassandra, what GitHub says that? Okay, install this code, get the code, get Cassandra, get Redis, get this, get that. Here, you just need to download an image which has Cassandra in it, which has Redis in it. It has working, running version. Sim and you're just running that. That's the beauty about this. So what I like about it, if I need to play around, like I, I just get a new image and you know, start playing around with that. 
And you can also use Docker Swarm, and we'll talk about some examples for this. Uh, but there are some limitations with this one, like, you know, when you're using it, because you might have, you know, different swarms there, and how do they interact with each other? You know, there might be some issues coming with that one. Okay, so what it means that Docker is basically a shipping container. So if you look at this, like, you know, you have a static website, and we'll have an example of static website, and we'll go, we're going to deploy that website just in a second. Um, and you might have a front-end analytics which you are doing. Put everything in this container. It doesn't matter what you put inside this. But it will just, uh, you know, and deploy it wherever you want to deploy it. That's the beauty about, you know, Docker as a whole. So another aspect which is important is that, and I did talk about this as a whole, that you have to, when you're designing for, for, for these, these Docker and you know, you're putting in the images, you want to still code correctly. Design principles are still the same. You, know, you want to make sure that, uh, that it is fault tolerant. You know, that means if something goes wrong on one of the, one of the nodes, you have to go to another node. And that's, that, that's very critical. This is an example where, uh, you know, Netflix is, you're watching a movie and this goes down. And by the way, this is exactly the same thing you need to do as part of your testing also in a Docker image you shut down a Docker image and start the Docker image again, it should be able to spawn really fast. That's the key part here, you know, which, which, which I'm trying to say. So you install the Docker image and because it's going down, it will start up again. Because there are tools which, which knows that, let's say you're installing um, an, an image and you're saying, hey, I need to have five concurrent versions, five nodes working. If one node goes down, orchestrating tool, and that can be anything, that can be Kubernetes, that can be DCOS, or any other tool can, can be there. What it can do is it will respawn back that same image. It will make sure one node is available for you all the time. That's the key part here, which is there. So what we're trying to do is, you can do Docker build, uh, or you can say Docker pull. When you say Docker pull, from the Docker registry, I'm going to get NextNG. I'm going to get NextNG from Docker registry. And if I have within my local environment that NextNG already available, I'm going to reuse that same one. If it is not there, it will get it from the Docker Hub, and I'll start using it. That's the, the, uh, that's the mode which it's trying to use. Okay. So what do we do? Okay, let's try it out. So we have Docker Hub here. So it's hub.docker.com. You know, when you can uh, you can go to this site, and uh, you know you can build your own repository. You can add your own code here, and uh, you know you can create a new repository if you want to create it. You know, put give your give some name to this repository, whether what repository you want to make, make it public. You know, all those things you can do. You can also explore. You can also find out what are the existing repositories present. So as you can see, NextNG, a lot of people have downloaded NextNG from here. But any repository you can think of, like for example, MongoDB, um, Hello World, you know, a lot of people are uh, using that. So what are we going to do? We're going to get that repository from, the, from this particular site and start using it. You can also download Kitematic. So Kitematic is a tool which you can download. Just went down. Okay, so what it means that, because so let me just go over this for a second. So what I'm trying to do is that I'm going to try to deploy that particular application. So let me, let me do that deployment of that application right now. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to build a scenario.
where I'm going to first go in and find out, search for Redis images which are available. So right now it's showing me that, okay, these are all the Redis images which are available. And I can see Redis, this is the official image which I think we can use. So you can see that if some image is official or not. So you can, you can use that particular image um, as a whole. Now what else can you do is you can run that Redis image so when I run that Redis image, what it did was, it gave me a SHA. So it gave me an image ID. So it, it, it gave me that particular image. So what I can do is I can say, Docker PS, it's telling me what image, what container is running at a given time. So this is the container which is running. I, and you can see that particular container is running. You can also get like the latest version of Redis. I mean, if you don't supply it, it will, it will get, still get the latest version, but you can say, hey, I want to get the latest version. Now, how many containers are running for me? Two containers are running right now. So what I can do is, um, I can find out, I can do Docker PS. Now it's giving me two containers. Uh, one started 13 seconds ago, and there's another one. But what you can also do is you can inspect that container. You, say, you can say, Docker inspect, and then you can put in the container ID. So this is the container ID. And it will give me like what all things are there for that, for this particular container. Um, this is a Redis box, and it's giving me like the details about that, what's the mounts which are available, uh, where are the mounts? Mounts means what directly they are available. What are the different directories which are available where you are putting in the data? That's what you get at the end. You can also find out the logs. So you can say, and you can uh, you can find out what's the log for that particular uh, particular images. And also you can access the Redis container itself. So what you can do is you can say run, and you can run on a particular port. So what I'm trying to do here is, I'm running on a particular port. So uh, uh, 6363, six, uh, you know, 6397. 6397 is the port where I'm running on. And it, it will run on that particular port. That's what it's doing here. Now what else can you do? But with this port, I am actually hard coding the port. What if you want to do load balancing? And you want to say, hey, dynamically assign the port. How can I dynamically assign the port? I can say Redis dynamic, and then I say minus P, and I'm not adding colon, uh, colon 6367. So what it's doing is it's using the dynamic port and using it. So if I want to find out what's my port looks like, this is the port which it has got. Uh, it has got 32768. That's the port which is there. And if I look at the Docker PS, now, because I ran two different, two other, uh, you know, containers, it's showing me both the containers. Make sense? Yeah? So that's pretty cool. So, I mean, that's, that's nice to uh, see that. Now, what else can I do? Now, how can you persist the data? Now, what happened was that, you know, you started using this particular tool, but all the data which you're using, it's, you should mount it to some drive. Make sense? So from where you going to get the data from? S3. If you are using S3, if you use Amazon, you want to mount the S3 drive. Or if you want to using your local drive, you're going to mount that local drive. So what we can do is we can mount that particular drive. So in this case, what I'm doing is uh, I'm doing minus V option. And after I do minus V option, it's going to go to this directory, OPT, Docker, Data, Redis. That's the directory it will go to. It'll get me a in instance for that one. So what it means that Docker also you can, you can whatever directory you are running the Docker with, you can say PWD also, that, that should also work for this one. Now, you can also run the container in the foreground. So what it means that you can say Docker run Ubuntu. Ubuntu is another image. So just like this image, I got a Ubuntu image in this case. So I say Docker run Ubuntu and now, I got Ubuntu image running. So if I do Docker PS now, so if I do here PS, 
Now I can see my Ubuntu is running right now uh, for that one. What I can also do is docker run Ubuntu bash. So what it means that when I do minus IT, are you guys able to see minus IT? When you do minus IT, it means that now, so if I do PWD here, I am, I am within that container now. Okay, I can go to that particular directory which I created, and then, so and, and you know go within it and and get that particular value. Make sense? Yeah. What else can you do? You can also just like this. You can also um, get HTML website. Now you have a HTML website which you want to create. Now here is the layering. I'm talking about the layering aspect. Make sense? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the layering aspect of it. So I'm going to, first thing what I'm going to do is from NextNG Alpine. So what's the first layer I'm adding? NextNG, yes. And, and then, and then copying, copy the user shared NextNG HTML. That's the, that's the next thing which I'm doing here. That's, that's the only thing which I'm doing, creating a task for within the Docker file. So I'm creating something called Docker file. Okay, after I create the Docker file, I'm going to build the Docker file. Then I'm going to publish the Docker file, it will go to where? Docker Hub. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to build the image. That's my next task. So I'm going to say build minus T, and then I'm going to say because I'm in that particular directory, it's pulling the image and it's actually pulling it from Docker Hub that particular image and it's building that particular image and build is successful. But if I do here docker images, it's going to show me what all are the images which are available in the system right now. So these are all the images which are available in the system. Now what I can do is I can run that particular image. So what I can say docker run. So when I ran this particular command, it's basically running that image uh, web server image version one which I'm running. So if I do a curl, I'll say hello world here. Not only that, what I can do is I can actually go to the server. So if I go to this server, it's showing me hello world. So it's actually, you know, uh, using the same thing, uh, same particular connection to get to it. Make sense? Yeah. Now, not only this, what you can also do is, uh, uh, there is something called Docker Swarm. So that means now you got one image deployed. You want to make sure that you don't have only one image available for you. This client can call two images and still be able, you can distribute the load between the two images. So what you can do is for that purpose, so you have a node, so let's start this scenario here. So first of all, what you need to do is that you have to say Docker Swarm minus minus help. So when you do minus minus help, it gives me like initialize the swarm. So that's the first thing you need to do. Whenever you start a Docker, Docker images, you can do one image at a time. But here you are initialize the swarm. And then you have to join the first Docker image which is, which is created. So that's, that's, that's the key part here. So let me initialize this swarm right now, which is just started. I just started that initialization and then to add to the worker you said you say this is a token you see this token here you have to copy this token you can just copy this token and then you can create another uh, you know an, another another image and then work on it so let's talk about that now what you can do is you can join that particular image so what you can do is first get the token this exact same token which I'm saying here so you got the token in a variable. Now what I can do is I can say docker swarm join. When I say docker swarm join, then this node is joined to a docker swarm version. Make sense? Yeah. Now what I can do is I can say docker load ls. And it's going to give me two nodes which are ready to go in this particular case. And which is which is exactly you know what you what you can do here in, in this case. 
Okay, so now let's go back to our, our slide deck for a second. Let me see Kubernetes. Huh? How do you monitor the health of the system? Yeah. Yeah, so there are many ways to monitor the health of the system. I mean, I, I didn't go over that, but what I can do is I can point you to the location uh, because we probably won't have enough time to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to go over that one. But what I can do is, So you can, you can say docker ps, and then docker ps tells like what containers are running. So when I was running that, you can find out what containers are actually running at a given time. So um, you, you can actually uh, also find out like, you know, what are the container logs which are there. Like, you know, you can, you can maintain the container logs and things like that. And that's where you can find out if some container is going down, then orchestrating tool should be able to use that. So hold on that point, and you know, when, I, when I'm going to talk about Kubernetes, they provide a way of like, you know, making sure to find out what the health is also, another way to do the same thing. But you can use docker ps command uh, to find out what, what's available for you. So what I did was, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just go through this quickly. Uh, you created a, so we already did this, guys. So I'm just going to repeat this for a second. So you create a Docker file, you build the Docker, and then you can push it to the registry. And once you push it, then anybody can pull that registry and run it. Okay? That's the state diagram. Yes. Yes. You can also have your own. Yes. Yeah. Enterprise version also you can have. There's, there's no need to... This is like for trying out, you can use that, but you can have your own version also. Yeah. That's a good question. So what you do is you can have, I mean, you can have all these commands. I mean, I didn't spend time on that. You can have images. I did some of them uh, with you. Uh, you can inspect what the IP address is by using this IP address command. Uh, bin bash, we did that uh, just now. Hello NFJS, it's an easy you know, command uh, to use. You can also find docker logs and docker stop. So you can stop the container using docker stop. Just easy commands to use. I mean, docker ps, we used that um, before. Now, it's a, you know, of course, this is the docker hub. You can go to the docker hub, install the docker hub, and, you know, build your particular application. So in this application, what I'm doing is that I'm going to build the docker file. So this is my docker file from this is my location. This is my Docker image ID, which is in the Docker Hub. From this, download from there, run get app, uh, app get. I'm going to run Fortunes. Fortunes is another, another program. I'm going to app get these two pro this program, and then run this command, Cosplay Best, at the end. So that's, that's what it's trying to do, where you're doing a tag. When you apply the tag, and then you can create that particular image ID, and it, it will create the build for that uh, particular tag image. What it means that you can, once you create it, then you can log into your Docker image and push it to that image. That's what you're trying to do, nothing more than that. Okay? And this is the Docker deployment. When you deploy it, you know, you get like one layer is just getting this, one program is this. Another program is this. You can, it will just, you can keep on running that same thing. Okay. So what it means that, you know, Docker registry is, is a key part which is keeping all, all of them um, available for us. Now for orchestration, we just talked about it. For orchestration, we have like, you know, data center, um, Docker Swarm, we just talked about it. You can create two thread, three threads and use that way. Mesosphere, probably won't get time to look at that, but in my next talk, I'll talk about Mesos also, um, to some extent, and uh, and then Kubernetes, like that's the one we're going to talk about next. And Docker Swarm, we t we just did that, like you know, we did the help and then Swarm in it, uh, and we copied this token, and then join. That's the join command to join that particular image. Okay, let's talk about Kubernetes. 
That's, that's the next thing we need to look at. So what Kubernetes, what it provides is that anything, this is, there's something called Kubernetes masters, and then there is uh, something called Minikube. And you can download the Minikube version, and you can download it to your own laptop and start using it. It can, it can create, you, you can create your own cluster image, and you can have multiple images working at the same time, and, and they can interact with each other also. So what you're doing is you can have either through API or CLI uh, or through UI, you can, you have a Kubernetes uh, master is there. You can have multiple nodes which can go to the registry and then uh, use it, use it that way. So let's, let's talk about Minikube for a second. So Minikube is a, is a simple version uh, which you can download and, you know, uh, start using it. So what I'm going to do is, Okay, so it is running. That's a good news. Okay, that's a good thing. All right. So I have the exercises. So I'm going to also include these exercises. You guys can try this out, whatever I'm doing here. So it won't be something, you know, um, uh, it would be easier for you to do it that way. So install. Once you install it, then hello Kubernetes. So you can kub, mini cube, you can start the mini cube. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start Minikube. So let me clear this first. I'm starting the Minikube right now. So it's starting the local Kubernetes cluster. And then I can, there's something called cube tell. So in the meanwhile, you can also download, there is a GitHub version, and let me just show you that for a second, um, and then we can come back to it when, it when it comes up. So there is a GitHub, so this is the GitHub. I mean, you can, you can get the code from there. This is the Kubernetes code which is there. And uh, what you are trying to do is you're trying to run localhost. So let me see if the server is up and running. If it is, we'll use this one. Okay, this is perfect. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to go through some of some of these concepts with you, and and then you know we can uh, yeah. we can work through with this. I'm sorry. So it's going to have uh, you know you can have multiple nodes. And I'll talk about this in a second. Like, this is going to give you a good understanding, um, you know, what's, what's really going on with this one. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, I'm going to first create the Kubernetes cluster. That's the first thing we're going to do. And then we're going to deploy our application. And basically, with that application, explore that application, find out, like, different methods to use for there. And, uh, Later on, we're going to scale that application. We're going to scale from using one server, I'm going to add more servers to it. And then update an application. So it does provide a kind of a framework to do all these things. So that's, so that's what it, it, it provides right now. Um, and uh, so what I'm doing is, uh, this is the master node. Everything is controlled through the master node. And you can have a kubelet, or you, know, you, you, can, have a, uh, you can have a Docker image. So th these are the two things it has got. So you can have a Docker image, which you, which we already talked about Docker image, where to get the Docker image from. So let's just do this quickly. So I'm going to do is, I'm going to try to see what's my Minikube version is. So this is the Minikube version, which is there. I can start the Minikube. So it's going to start the Kubernetes cluster. So it just started that. And you can find out what the cluster information is. When you say cluster information, it's telling me there's a Kubernetes master is there, which is running. It has a dashboard. So now there is a dashboard which where it's running that particular uh, cluster. 
and uh, you know which we can we'll look at in a second but you can find out get nodes so only one node is available right now because we have not added anything yet so what we need to do next is We're going to deploy our first application. That's the first thing we need to do. So when I'm deploying an application, it means that this is my application. I'm containerized app, which I have got. I'm going to deploy this particular app. So how I'm going to deploy it is that um, the first thing we need to do is this is a Node.js app, which I'm going to deploy. So first thing we can do is we can find out what's the version which we are using. This is the Kubelet version which is there. And you can download it. So I mean, the steps are there. You can, uh, yeah, I'll send the steps also how to do this. So it will be easier for you to uh, do that. And you can say get nodes. Only one node is available. We did that in the last time we did that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy Kubernetes master. So here. I have created Kubernetes Bootcamp. That's the sample application which is which is which is part of this uh, this application I'm going to deploy. And then when I do get deployments, it gives me that one deployment is available for me. That's what it's trying to say here. So that means I can actually find out what the proxy is. So I'm going to start the server for the proxy. So this is starting the server. It's starting at this particular mode. Now what I can do is I can curl based on it. That means when I got that particular name for that, uh, for that particular proxy, I can curl. What curl is doing is it's just doing hello. It's just doing hello Kubernetes bootcamp. That's what it's doing here, which is pretty cool. So what it's saying is that now we have created our application. We deployed our application and we are able to see it in a HTTP format and we, we, can, we can see this value coming through, which is, which is pretty good uh, for this purpose. So let me go back to the slides for a second. So what we just did was, so we have a node, so a node, uh, a node is here and you can deploy any of the um, containerized application in this. Um, these are all the different statuses you can you can put in for Minikube. Um, we talked about some of them just now. And we deployed our first application. Now the key part here is that um, after we deploy the application, you can actually go and uh, find out a dashboard. A dashboard means like this is a dashboard, probably won't get time, uh, got like 10 more minutes left. But you can go to the dashboard and find out that, you know, uh, that Kubernetes bootcamp is running. Um, and then, you know, you might have like two or three bootcamps running within that. Now, this is the orchestration tool. That means you can have now lot of images, just like dot .locker swarm. You can have lot of images, but now you have one place to look at it. At one place, you know, you can come in here and you look at exactly, you know, what's going on. You know, whether you are asking me a question regarding the health of the system. This is the health of the system. You can find it out from here exactly what's going on with this. Now, what else can you do? This is the IP address which is given. Now, this is the volume and these are containerized app which are there. Pod 1, 2, 3, 4. Design principle wise, I really like this. Because what it's trying to do, let's understand that. Co-locate all the REST APIs or all the services which are intermingling with each other. Yes, that's one of the design principles we have got. We want to make sure our application is really fast. Okay, you don't want your, to put a service from here to here. So if I get a request, it's going to go to three, four places, but it's going to reply back from there. That's the beauty about this. Second beauty is that because it's a containerized app, what you can do is you can, you can actually scale. And we'll talk about the example of the scaling in a second. But what you are doing is, this is a pod which we have created. This is a node. A, a node, node can run in a Docker image can run in a node. That's the Docker image which is there. You can have a pod 
can have multiple of these images and you can have some volumes also you know you can put it as part of that particular IP address itself now the key part here is that um, we talked about the kubelet proxy we just did that you can describe the pods also and find out regarding the pods but the important thing is till the time you provide a service nobody can use it isn't that a cool thing in Java, you create a public method and now you are, anybody can use it. Yes? That's not the case here. It's the beauty of the design. They have made sure that this service, till the time you expose this service, so anybody calling this service is going to call only this. How many versions of this is available? You can scale the versions if you want to scale the versions for this one. Um, and, and you can deploy, deploy the application. So what it means, you can also label them. You can say that, hey, uh, application B is here, application A is here. You can label these two applications and use them um, as part of your uh, application itself. And uh, this is just talking about the label request. Now, what else can you do? You can scale the application. And you know, if I have time, I can actually show you. What happens is when you say that I want to scale this application, um, this node you can have multiple of these services available. Service A, it, it, uh, one is, a, is in one place, in one node, it can expand, create two of them. What if one goes down? This goes down. What happened at the same time, the, because it's orchestration tool, you can kill that particular node. It will spawn again, right away. It will spawn it right away, which is actually a beauty, like that's really cool. Um, thing they did in this one. Now another problem is the updating of an application. You have a particular application you want to update. What, how do we update right now? We have, they have a concept of trying out whether the deployment worked. If the deployment worked, go ahead and update the version for everywhere. If the deployment did not work, roll back. Okay, which is pretty cool because now you don't, if you don't like the version which is going on, just like you know, uh, Netflix does that, they have a version only for some people, like who are in North, North Dakota, 10 people are watching movie, they just update a new version there. So they do QA in production. That's what they try, they do that uh, using this model. So you update it, you put in here replica of four, and then it will, it will create four replicas of this particular service. And then you can also say replica of two, it will reduce it also, which is auto scaling. Auto scaling is also very much possible in this case. Sounds good? So that's the key which I really like about, uh, like about this one. You can try this thing out, uh, you know, and when you're doing an update of a particular version, what you're doing is that you have a service which has been given here, you're updating this version. What happens if the version uh, there is a new IP address for this one, um, and if that version, if the if the if the version is good, it will update all it, all the other versions are updated at the same time. If the version is bad, then it will roll back. Both both the cases it, it does that in in this case. So in this case, it's a it's roll back in that particular application. So we talked about quite a few things. I mean, they were like, a, it was a jam-packed uh, uh, discussion on, on different things. Um, you can do the exact same thing uh, for, uh, for, uh, from here also, where you, know, you can scale the application. So let me show you the scale of the application. How do we do the scaling for that particular app? So, so it'll be easier to understand what's going on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale the application. So this one I got already got my application running. So I'm going to scale this app. Um, so let me start this interactive tool. So I got the deployment. So I only got like one deployment. So we already had one Kubernetes running before, yes? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, scale just by putting in the scale and saying four replica. It's going to create four replicas of it. Now if I do get deployments, it's going to say four. And it's going to say desired four, current is four, and updated is all four. 
That means it, they are all available for us to use it. So you can say wide, and it's going to also give in the IP addresses which needs to be used. So these are all the IP addresses which are which are given given for me to use in this case. And I can also describe them like in more detail, like what all things are contained within within each one of these. Make sense? So you can also uh, you know at the end load balance. So what that load balance is going to do? When I'm calling this particular function, if you see this. When I'm going to call it, it's going to call different Kubernetes versions. So see this NV is called, NV is called and the other one is called. So that means you can also do the versioning, like you know, you can do the load balancing pretty easily, you know, using this particular mechanism. So and then you can also scale down. Right now I got like four, I can make it two. So now I got only two there. If I do get deployments right now. I got only two here. But if I go to four, it's going to show me two are running and two are getting terminated, which is pretty good. Okay? That's 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 the good thing about this one. So all right. So well with that I think we have talked through quite a few things. So any questions on this? Which we have talked today? All the samples and everything is there, is listed here. So you, um, I will post these slides so it will be available for you guys to use later on. Right? Thanks, everyone. Thank you.